Colossians 3, verse 12. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. A lockdown here will be the biggest disruption to daily life. France has started its first day in lockdown. Shutdown of non-essential business. Strict lockdown laws. 16 million people are now in lockdown. Toughest restrictions. Corona crackdown. The lockdown could last six months. The AFL is off. It's full on, isn't it? Just to make sure your nightmares have got enough material to keep you going for the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to jump into uh, our talk tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much uh, that you are a God who speaks to us. We thank you that you have saved us uh, through what Christ has done for us on the cross. We pray, Father, as we meet tonight, as we gather, as we reset our minds for what uh, you would have us do uh, as a youth community this term, we pray, Father, uh, that you would give us soft hearts like Jacob wanted for his friends. Give us soft hearts that are ready to be molded and shaped by your word. And we pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, it is a little bit of a full-on video, that one, but I think if we stop to think about COVID and everything to do with it, we, um, we realize that it is kind of scary. It is kind of full on. It is kind of confronting. Um, generally, what we like to do with things that are like that, a little bit scary and confronting, we just sort of pretend not to think about them and we try to ignore them and we sort of push them to one side and we just sort of carry on with life the best we can. Um, but if we do stop to think about it, I think it's good to stop and think sometimes. If we do stop and think about it, we recognize that it is kind of scary. Um, you know, you flick on the news and the headlines are grim. You know, whether it's about the most recent case numbers, whether it's about the economic uh, future of our country whether, or, or around the world, or whether it's other things. You know, maybe we're going back into a lockdown. Maybe we're going to have a second wave. It's scary. And it's not just uh, the headlines now. It's thinking about the future, right? The future is uncertain. And what we do know about the future or what we, what we can sort of forecast about the future is really bleak. We're uncertain, we're unsure, it's kind of scary, it's changed life as we know it. And it's not just COVID, right? There's other things as well. You know, we've sort of uh, been talking a lot in the last few months as a world about racism and how big an issue that still is in our, is in our world. And we've been talking about um, China recently and sort of what's going on there and escalating tensions and we're sort of, who knows where that's going to end up? 
Like 2020 has shown us that our world is a scary place. It's taught us lessons, harsh realities about what our world is like. And so what we're going to do over the next four weeks is we're going to be thinking about lessons from a lockdown world. Not lessons that we need to teach you, but lessons that our society has learnt. Truths that are confronting, truths that are a little bit unsettling. But truths that are good to think about if we're going to live in this life, live in this world, and live this life. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to be thinking about the following things. Number one, this is what we're going to be looking at next week. We aren't in control. That's a lesson that we've learnt in a lockdown world. We like to be in control. We like to know where we're going to go, when we're going to do it. We have multi-year plans that we have. Right? You guys have been thinking about you know, what university course you're going to do and this and that and the other. We love being in control of our lives. We feel safe when we're in control of our lives. But one of the things that lockdown has done has shown us we're not in control. Right? The government might change restrictions next week. We might not be able to meet here next week. We're not in control. And the government's not even in control. Not the government. The, the number one thing they've been trying to do is control the virus, control the spread. And we haven't been able to do that. Not as successful as we thought we might. We're not in control. Now, that's scary. Unless you're a Christian. Because if you're a Christian, you go, well, of course. God's in control. Remember back to the uh, end of term one, if you were uh, coming to youth then and you were flicking onto our social channels through the end of the term one school holidays, we were thinking about our interrupt the day. Uh, what can Christians know in a crisis? And it started with God is in control. So if you're a Christian and you've been told you're not in control, you go, oh, of course, that's all right. Now we still might sort of worry about things and whatever, but ultimately we can know that God is in control. And actually it's a helpful reminder to us to know that God is in control. That's what we're looking at next week. We're not in control. Week after, stuff doesn't comfort. Now, we love stuff. Don't you love stuff, right? Your gadgets, your games, I don't know, your favorite pillow, whatever it is that you have around you to, you know, to, to comfort you, right? One of the things we've learned during lockdown is actually the stuff that we have in our lives doesn't comfort us in the way that we need. We need more than stuff we need something deeper more meaningful more purposeful to comfort us that's a lesson that we've learned from our world what the christians know in a crisis god is in control and he is good so we can be calm prayers ultimately our comfort comes from resting in the fact that god is in control and he is good so we can be calm prayers we're going to look different to the rest of our world even though our stuff doesn't comfort us in fact it's good to be reminded that our stuff doesn't ultimately comfort us. We need Jesus to do that. That's a lesson from our lockdown world we're going to be thinking about in a couple of weeks. Week after that, we're going to be thinking about the fact that tech isn't everything. Now, we are super thankful for tech. Using it at the moment, microphones, screens, you've noticed a little bit of an upgrade of some of the stuff that we've got at church because we've been doing some more things. Tech is good. Right? It's great. Well, maybe not great that we have to sort of still do school online. Um, but it's good. We can still chat to people. We can still see faces online, even if they're buffering and frozen half the time. Right? But tech is good. Right? Hooray, NBN. Um, but tech is good. But it's not everything. Now, we've learned that lesson over the last few uh, months, haven't we? That tech actually doesn't make our life as good as it could. And that's not the rest of it. The, the entirety of our reliance on tech Right? Our hope is in tech and the right technology and vaccines and whatever to, st to stop this virus. And maybe it will be able to do that, but maybe it won't. But even if it can, tech won't stop the problem of racism. And if there's a, a battle that kicks off in the South China Sea, well, tech just means you have a bigger problem. Tech isn't everything. Well, Christians know that. Because Christians know it's not tech that is everything but it's the hope that we have last holidays evan and luke were taking us through romans 8 and 12 if you're on the social channels and the interrupted day and we're thinking about how hope makes us distinct in a covid world hope makes us distinct we're thinking about passages like this in romans 8 verse 22 we know that the whole creation has been groaning right think about the creation think about the world Amidst a pandemic, we know that the whole creation has been groaning 
as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Now it talks there about those birth pains, right? The, the, um, yeah, the pains of childbirth. Now if you are a pregnant woman and you have pains, which you will, they're real. They suck. No one wants them. But they're a reminder to you that there is something that is great that is coming. Right? You're going to give birth to a child. And so the pains are worth it. They're worth persevering through because you know what is coming. And the Apostle Paul is saying the hope that is held out for us as Christians means that whatever happens in this world is worth persevering through like Birth pains are worth persevering through. So are the hard things in our world because we know that something better awaits us. So tech isn't everything. It can't, deal, it can't get rid of the pains in this life, even though it tries. But hope is everything. He keeps going. This is what makes us distinct. For in this hope... We were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And so where our world is running around like headless chooks, we wait patiently. We pray calmly. Now, this is not going to say that everything in your life feels absolutely wonderful and perfect. But we're in a global pandemic. It's going to suck sometimes. But we wait patiently knowing that there is a future hope that makes everything in this world worth persevering through. The final question that we're going to ask in this little series is, it isn't good to be alone. It's the fourth lockdown lesson that I think we've learnt. And what we've seen through all of these things is it's the gospel. The gospel that Jacob was thinking about and he's praying about for his friends to know and love. The gospel that has turned our things that we've done in the past, the things that, the idiotic things that we've done in the past and gets rid of them. The gospel, that story that Jesus left heaven where he was being worshipped by angels and came down to be human like us and lived the life that we couldn't live and died the death that we deserved to die so that our sins would be taken away from us because he paid the punishment and then rose from the grave so that we might be able to join him forever living out this hope that Paul was talking about that gospel message that actually has the answers to all the questions that you and your friends are asking the gospel of Jesus has the answers to the questions that you and your friends are asking. We've learned lessons in our lockdown world. And the gospel has answers to the questions that they prompt. That last question, though, it isn't good to be alone. We're going to think about that in week five of this term. It also sort of points us into the second half of our term uh, where we're thinking about something else. There we go. It isn't good to be alone. We were made for relationship, right? We were made to do life with other people. Now, we've learnt through a lockdown world that sometimes our relationships are a little bit strained. You might have been uh, at home and uh, you sort of can normally sort of just about exist as a family, right, during normal life and then sort of COVID lockdown came and well, it was, it was bad news, right? You're trying to sort of manage learning in the classroom while sort of dad was trying to work from home and mum was trying to work and it was just, you know, a little bit crazy. We were made for relationship. We were made to do life with one another. It isn't good to be alone. But how do we live with our relationships? Because we always seem to stuff them up. You know, it's interesting, I... Um, I've been married to my wife, Lauren, for almost four years now. Uh, and so about five years ago, uh, before we got engaged, um, I wanted to think a bit about what it means to sort of have a, a marriage that's, that's Christian, really, truly, deeply. And uh, so I went away and I had um, a week to think and read and pray and scribble thoughts down and that kind of stuff. And, um, and I came up with a surprising sort of conclusion 
And the conclusion was that the, the how-to advice uh, that our world gives about relationships is often actually quite similar to the how-to advice of what a, a Christian relationship might be. So here's what I mean. Um, if you were asking someone, random Joe Bloggs on the street, why is Joe Bloggs the name that gets given to the random person? Right? Who has the surname Bloggs? No one, right? But if you went to Joe Bloggs on the street, non-existent Joe Bloggs, and you asked him for what it makes, you know, how do I act to be, um, you know, have a good relationship with someone, and to be a good friend, he might say something like, well, uh, you know, well, if you clothe yourself with compassion, yeah, that's a good thing to do. Be compassionate to someone, be kind, humility, gentleness, and, and patience. They're good things to do, right? If you're that all the time, then you'll probably have a pretty good relationship with someone, whether it be a friend or a special sort of relationship. Uh, it's good advice. But the problem with that advice is we don't do it. Just, just picture your relationship with your brother or sister, right? If you don't have them, uh, then a parent will do. Now, you know that you're supposed to be compassionate to them, right? If they've fallen over, if they're you know, curled up in a ball crying or something. But gee, it's tempting to kick them when they're down, right? We're supposed to be kind. Yeah, you know, they, they, they've had a long day. They're tired. They're just sort of curled up on the couch. What you really want to do is wrestle them and get them off the couch, right? Just to, just to be a pain because that's what we do. Humble. Now, of course, this one we keep, don't we? We all think, right, that we're no better than our brother or sister. Of course not. We're proud. Of course we think we're the best. Of course we think we're the most important. We're supposed to be gentle. We're supposed to be patient with our brothers and sisters. Now, we know this is what we're supposed to do, but we don't do it. It doesn't make sense that the world might know that this is how we're supposed to behave. The problem is that we don't do it. So what is it that changes uh, relationships when it comes to whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian? Well, it's not necessarily the advice, but it's the power to do it. This actually comes from Colossians 3.12 in our Bible reading. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. As God's chosen people. You see, once again, it's the gospel that has the answers to the questions that you and your friends are asking. How do I actually live in a relationship? And it's the gospel that changes it all. As God's chosen people. In the gospel, we go from people who are estranged, we're distanced from God to those who are chosen by him. We go from people who are sinful to holy. We go from people who are unrighteous and rejected by God to those who are dearly loved. How do we make that change? Because Jesus put on, he clothed himself with compassion, kindness. You know, the picture of Jesus, he's walking down the street and he's, he's healing lepers, people with leprosy, people who were rejected by everyone else in their world and sort of shunned and pushed to the margin. And Jesus goes and touches them and heals them because he has compassion. He has kindness. He has humility. Leaving heaven where he was, if Jesus had an ego that he wanted to be stoked, he'd stay in heaven where he was worshipped by angels, but he didn't because he came to be like us. Gentle. He's oh so patient with scumbags like me. And so as Jesus has shown me those things, as Jesus has shown me compassion, I now know what it's like to be treated with compassion. As Jesus is kind to me. I know what it's like to be treated with kindness, perfect kindness. I've seen Jesus' humility. I've witnessed and benefited from his gentleness and his patience. And so the difference that Christianity brings to our relationships is that we are perfectly loved. And so we can therefore love others and spur them on and point them back to the God who loves them so deeply. And so whatever relationships it is that we're going to think about, and over this term we're going to think about um, uh, being a son or a daughter, brother or sister. 
We're going to think about dating and how we do that. We're going to be thinking about Christian friendship. It's interesting when we think about dating. I was at the 6 to 8 group before talking about this and talking about dating and, you know, oh, yuck, you know, girls, not boys, you know. I say that to the 9 to 12s and the guys are like, oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. That's good. All right, getting amped up. All right, you're like, how, how many push-ups did I do last night? You know, how, how tight's my shirt? You know, did I put deodorant on? No, I did it yesterday, that's all right. You know? We'll think about dating. How do we do that well? How do we do that as Christians? And it's interesting because uh, when I went away and I was thinking about this for Lauren and I, um, we came up with a statement that sort of summarized what we think Christian marriage looks like uh, and Christian relationships look like. I think it's true for all relationships. And it goes like this. It says, we are recipients of ultimate vertical love. So we will respond with extreme horizontal love to each other, the church and the world. Living under his lordship will choose kingdom over comfort, which means everything's on the table because we're living in light of eternity. I think that's what sums up Christian friendship. Recognizing that we've been perfectly loved so we can respond to Jesus' love with love for our friend, love for our boyfriend, girlfriend, love for our mum or dad, love for our brother or sister. And as we spur them on to love and good deeds, we point them back to the God who's loved them so infinitely. That's what we're going to be looking at for the second half of the term. It's great. It's what our world needs to hear because the gospel has the answers to the questions that you and your friends are asking. Just to finish, I want to encourage you to know that your leaders and I are in the trenches with you when it comes to chatting to your friends about Jesus. Um, We talk about at Restart the fact that we are building the next generation of revolutionary disciples, that that's something that we want to do uh, together. Uh, We want to be on the front foot chatting to our friends about Jesus. And so I want to share um, um, about my mate Jake. Uh, He's a guy, uh, a friend from footy, um, and he has not just had sort of uh, the lockdown world to um, teach him sort of lessons and challenges. Um, Earlier in the year, his sister and her boyfriend were down in Melbourne and um, were victims of an unprovoked gang attack. Uh, And it's tragic. Um, Her boyfriend died uh, and she was stabbed multiple times and got very significant injuries. And as I've been chatting to Jake about it, I've I've tried to have in the back of my mind, the gospel has the answers to the questions that he's asking. And as he's been sharing about it, and as I've tried to be listening to him, he, he's talked about how this is not just something that happens. This is evil, right? They didn't do anything to provoke these people. Like his sister didn't do anything wrong. But she's been so deeply affected. This is unfair. It's unjust. It's evil. And so gently and slowly... I'm trying to talk to Jake about how actually evil does exist in our world. I think he's right. And that ultimately we need Jesus to deal with the problem of evil because nothing else can get rid of it. So I would love it if you could pray for my mate Jake and let me know who I can pray for for you as we the next generation of revolutionary disciples help our world to see how good Jesus is and how desperately they need him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the solution to our world's problems. We thank you that he has dealt with our sin. We thank you that he has confronting everything in our world that is evil. And we pray, Father, for our friends who don't know him. We pray, Lord, for those in this room who are still wrestling with who who you are and who your son is and how that all fits together. Father, we pray that you would do a mighty work in all of us. Keep spurring us on to love Jesus more. Help us to be bold as we share him with our friends. And may we be in the business of reconnecting our world with its creator. And we pray that in his name. Amen.